Hello and welcome back to the channel for the second of my videos anticipating Sunday's episode of Doctor Who, The Halloween Apocalypse. I previously did a video looking at the synopsis for this episode, seeing what we could glean from it. And this video is going to be taking a similar approach, but looking at the cast list for the episode. So every actor that we know is in the Halloween apocalypse, because of course there could be some that they're deliberately holding back and not mentioning prior to broadcast. But this is everybody that we do know for sure is going to appear in the episode. So I've used two sources for this. The first one is the official BBC Doctor Who website, which has a slightly shorter cast list. And then in the Radio Times, there's a slightly longer one with more of the characters playing bit parts and cameos and what have you. So I'm going to be going through every single one, going through what we know about the characters these people might be playing from filming, from photos, from the trailers, from any other information, and just generally theorising about the role they might have to play in the episode. So first off, obviously, we have the Doctor, played by Jodie Whittaker. We have Yasmin Khan, played by Randall Gill. We have Dan Lewis, played by John Bishop, and Jacob Anderson, playing Vinda. I don't think I need to focus any more on those four actors. We then have Craig Ells, playing Carvanista the furry dog creature that I think we're all very familiar with by now. There's been a lot of speculation, which you've no doubt seen, that Carvanister is going to disguise himself as a human at some point in the episode, a theory which is purely based on the teaser we got that introduced Dan to us on New Year's Day, in which Craig Ailes appeared, but not in prosthetics as, you know, himself as Dan's workmate. Of course, it's entirely possible that Craig Giles is either playing two different characters within the episode, or indeed that this workmate character was only devised for that teaser clip and isn't actually featuring in the episode itself. And of course, because of all the COVID restrictions and bubbles and things that had to be applied to production of Series 13, it would have made total sense to reuse an actor who was otherwise in prosthetics, you know, the rest of the time, just for that little segment, rather than having to bring someone else in. So there could be more to that, there could not. It's hard to tell at this stage. But what we do know for sure is that Craig Ells will be appearing, for some of the time at least, in prosthetics as Carvinister the dog. Uh, we don't know what race Carvinister is, we don't really know anything about him. I've speculated in other videos and on Twitter and stuff that perhaps he could be the henchman to another villain character, but again that's just speculation, uh, it's not based on anything in particular. Next up we have a very interesting one, a character who we didn't know was going to be in series 13 until just like last week really. And I think I might have been one of the first people, if not the first person, to actually spot this because we saw this name in the cast list, Joseph Williamson, played by actor Steve Oram, and it took a, a while, I think, for this to catch on, but basically I googled the name just out of the blue because I thought, hang on a minute, this is a bit weird that we're getting the full name of this character. Is it significant? And I guess in the back of my mind I was kind of thinking, hang on a minute, could Joseph Williamson be a real life historical figure. And that's exactly what he is. He's a 19th century businessman slash philanthropist who was based in Liverpool and oversaw the construction of the Williamson Tunnels, a network of tunnels or at least vaulted rooms. I think the, the exact description of them as tunnels is, is somewhat contested. But basically, yeah, it's, it's a network of tunnels in inverted commas underneath Edge Hill, which is a suburb of Liverpool. I've written a brief sort of Google about these tunnels just to see what the history of them is and, and sort of try and work out, you know, what the appeal might be to feature them and to feature Williamson in Doctor Who. And there does seem to be a little bit of mystery surrounding them. I quote from Wikipedia that the purpose of the tunnels remains unclear and a subject of heavy speculation. Suggestions include commercial quarrying, a philanthropic desire to provide employment, and Williamson's own eccentric interests. So perhaps we're going to see Doctor Who put its own spin on this historical mystery, as we've seen so many times before, you know, for instance with Agatha Christie's disappearance in The Unicorn and The Wasp. Doctor Who just loves to sort of fill in those gaps and give its own spin on these mysteries. And so perhaps within the Doctor Who universe, the purpose of these tunnels was alien in some way, you know, to do with the Sontarans or some other alien menace, and, you know, we're going to get some storyline based around that. A little bit further down in the Radio Times cast list, not on the website, but in the Radio Times specifically, we also get the actor Paul Leonard playing a character called James Stonehouse, 
who again is a historical figure. He was a contemporary of Williamson and he toured the tunnels and made notes on them and made sketches of them. And sure enough, one of the promo pics for the Halloween apocalypse shows Joseph Williamson with another historical figure in top hat and period getup. And that would seem to be this other figure, James Stonehouse. So presumably we're gonna get some interaction between that pair in the episode quite how they're actually going to fit into everything else that we know is going on, you know, this sort of modern day invasion of Liverpool by the Sontarans and Weeping Angels and God knows what else, and the introduction of Dan and everything with the Doctor and Yaz chasing Carbonista, quite how this is going to fit into all of that, I'm not quite sure. I mean, obviously Liverpool is the common link here, so perhaps we're going to cut back and forth between past and present, I don't know, perhaps something that Joseph Williamson does in the past is going to have an impact on stuff that's happening in the present with Dan and with the Sontarans and whatever. I can't quite work it out, I have to say. And even stranger, I mean, I am getting a bit ahead of myself here, but Steve Oram does also appear to be credited for episode two, War of the Sontarans. So somehow this historical philanthropist and businessman responsible for the Williamson Tunnels is also going to be appearing in an episode primarily about the Crimean War and the Sontarans and all this other stuff in episode two. So yeah, very intrigued to see quite how this figure is going to fit into the story. And I'm particularly curious because obviously they've kept this one under wraps for so long. I don't think anybody knew anything about this character or even knew who he was before seeing him in the cast list and then subsequently Googling him and working out who he is. By contrast, we have a very familiar face up next. It is Nadia Albina, who's playing a character called Diane Curtis, and she was, of course, spotted at the Liverpool filming back in March with John Bishop, you know, at the Museum of Liverpool and the Liverpool Metropolitan Cathedral, and at that bombed out church as well, and possibly somewhere else, I lose track. But uh, yeah, basically, the two of them were seen together, possibly sort of on a, a date or having a conversation, having coffee together at least it would seem. I think based on dialogue that was overheard on set, the implication is that Diane is either a former or current love interest for Dan. And I think we basically got from those filming pics that she is an employee of the Museum of Liverpool. But in a more recently released promo pic, if you zoom in very closely to her lanyard, you'll see the words general manager which would seem to imply that she's got an even more significant role there. She's not just, you know, working on the reception desk or something. She is basically the manager of the museum, which, you know, could have no bearing on the story whatsoever, but it's an interesting detail nevertheless, I guess. And in addition to those scenes set in and around the Museum of Liverpool, it would also appear from another promo pic that Diane features a sort of haunted house setting, I think is the best way I can describe it. The scene in question seems to be set at night and she's not in her museum uniform, she's in casual clothes and looks to be sort of waiting for someone, waiting to meet someone perhaps. Perhaps that person is Dan, perhaps they've arranged to meet at this haunted house to sort of have a bit of an investigate maybe and see what's going on. And then the last character to appear on both the website and Radio Times cast lists is Sam Spruell as Swarm. Now, obviously, Chris Chibnall teased us with that word swarm way back in July, I think it was, for the Comic-Con panel. That was his sort of teaser word for the series. And at the time, we sort of theorised, you know, perhaps swarm could be an acronym for something. Perhaps it could be some sort of organisation with loads of different people in it, loads of different monsters, maybe. But I don't think anyone guessed that swarm could actually be a person or some sort of presence, I mean not necessarily a physical presence, it could be some sort of disembodied thing with Sam Spurrell just providing voice. Though I have to say, if you do Google Sam Spurrell and look at pictures of him, he has a very distinctive face and a physicality just generally. And he's also six foot one, so that would seem to suggest to me that they are making use of his physicality and that he is, you know, appearing in prosthetics or something. But just who or what Swarm is remains to be seen. I mean, there's been lots of speculation that perhaps he could be playing one of the so-called Ravagers, these two skeletal aliens that we've seen in the trailer and in promo pics. Of course, we are just presuming that these creatures are the Ravagers based on a comment from Chris Chibnall about there being two of them. I guess it could be that they are the Ravagers, they are members of the, the Ravager race, but they have their own individual character names and the male one is called Swarm. But that's certainly one of the most intriguing takeaways from this cast list. I think a lot of people, myself included, are very eager to see 
quite what this character Swarm is and how it's realised on screen and to finally get answers to that teaser from Chidnall way back at Comic Con to finally see quite what is going on here. If that wasn't enough to turn your brain to slush, we've also got in the Radio Times cast listing the character Old Swarm, played by Matthew Needham, which suggests a number of things. It suggests, first and foremost perhaps, that we're going to see an older version of the same character, played by Sam Spruell, though there are a number of factors which sort of throw that into doubt for me, not least the fact that Matthew Needham is actually younger than Sam Spruell by seven years. He's 37, whereas Spruell is 44. So basically, I don't think these are two versions of the same character. I think they're two different characters, which then suggests possibly that Swarm is not just one character, one name, it's possibly the name for a whole host of aliens or a whole race even, which in turn then throws the whole Ravager thing into question. It really is anyone's guess. Again, I've no clue whatsoever what is going on here. You know, it's enough to have this mysterious character Swarm appearing in the cast list. Then you get this as well, Old Swarm. I just don't have a clue. And oh boy, it only gets better from here because next up we have Rashenda Sandal playing a character called Anna, according to the Radio Times cast list, which, you know, is all well and good. We've seen a promo pic of her seemingly in present day dress, seemingly in a present day setting, seemingly as a sort of therapist of some description in a chair with an iPad, presumably looking at someone else sitting in a chair opposite her. But once again, there are a couple of things that throw this obvious, simple explanation into doubt. So first of all, there is just general sort of speculation and stuff. And I've got to say, you know, when I heard that Rashanda Sandal was going to be in the series and saw the photo they used in the tweet announcing it, I think it was the Radio Times that used a particular photo of her. And I just looked at that photo and I thought, well, she's the Rani, surely, you know. And OK, since then, I have sort of backed down from that stance a little bit. I don't want to set myself up for disappointments or anything like that. But there was just something about that photo, that particular photo of her, which suggested Rani to me. And I thought, oh my god, you know, her and Sasha alongside each other as Rani and Master would just be phenomenal. The only thing I've seen her in is Line of Duty Series 4, in which she played Lisa McQueen, a member of an organised crime gang. So, you know, yeah, maybe that is what's sort of tainting my view of her a little bit, I suppose, and suggesting to me that perhaps she's not quite as nice a character as that image of her as a therapist makes her out to be. It must be said as well that, that photo of her as a sort of therapist character, it would seem, gives me huge flashbacks to the Sherlock episode, The Lying Detective, where Eurus, Sherlock's sister, disguised herself as a therapist and basically put on this whole act of being a nice person only to then take the mask off at the end of the episode and reveal herself to be evil as they come. So perhaps that is also influencing my view of this character somewhat as well. I think I think it'll be fair to say. Basically, I just don't trust her really. I think there's something funny about this character. There's more to her than meets the eye. And there is a bit of evidence to suggest this, actually, two things in particular. So firstly, to get ahead of myself once again, in the cast list for War of the Sontarans, the second episode of the series, she's listed again, but not as the same character, or at least not under the same name. So whereas in this episode, she's seemingly playing a character called Anna, in that episode, she's seemingly playing a character called Azure which admittedly sounds similar, but is spelled slightly differently. It's basically another word for the colour blue, for sky blue in particular, which has led some people to think that perhaps that's her under all the prosthetics as the other Ravager, because obviously her skin is blue, whether it's sky blue or not is up for discussion, I suppose. And that's certainly a possibility, but I think there is one particular detail which is even more intriguing and possibly even more enlightening, which a lot of people seem to have glossed over. Basically, if you go back to that promo pic of her in therapist mode and look ever so carefully at the coaster on which her glass of wine or whatever it is, is placed, you might notice something ever so slightly unusual about the shape of that coaster. It's a hexagon. Now on the face of it, that might not seem particularly noteworthy, to which I'd say, 
go back to Fugitive of the Jadoon, the first few moments of that episode where we meet Ruth for the first time, who later turns out to be a Time Lord in disguise, the Doctor, no less. And there's a particular shot of her which a lot of people picked up on afterwards and was sort of heavily implied to be an easter egg alluding to the fact that she is the Doctor, that she's a Time Lord. And that was, of course, the hexagonal mirror which she looks in just before leaving her home for the day to go out and work as a tour guide. So, what I'm proposing here, and I know it sounds a bit outlandish perhaps, and a bit unlikely, and it could just be nothing, it could be that that coaster was chosen not to imply that she's a Time Lord or anything, you know, but just because it was a funky coaster. But I'm suggesting that no, this is intentional. It is a deliberate Easter egg that has been placed there, both in the promo pic and then in the episode itself when it comes, and that it does allude to the fact that she is a Time Lord of some description in disguise, undercover, much like Ruth was. You know, whether that's the Rani, or another of the Timeless Doctors, or some other Time Lord entirely that we've never met before. Whatever the case, I think that all those things added together definitely imply that there is more to this character than meets the eye. I don't think she is just a human therapist called Anna. I think that is just scratching the surface. I think there's definitely more to this character than meets the eye. They wouldn't get her in just to play a simple human therapist. There's got to be more to this than we currently know about. Credited next, we have Annabelle Scully as Claire, a character who we heard a bit about in the press pack interviews and who we've seen briefly in the trailer and also in some promo pics, one of which has been confirmed to be from this episode, one of which is sort of implied to possibly come from later in the series. Now, the interesting thing about this character is that in one of the photos, she's in seemingly present day dress, seemingly in a present day setting as well, with the Weeping Angel behind her, which I'll come back to in just a second. And then in the other image, she's pictured in period dress, it would seem, in a period location, specifically Fry's Point House on Barry Island, which was indeed used for filming with the Weeping Angels and is rumoured to be featuring later in the run, possibly around about episode four, which leads me to believe that perhaps what we're gonna see is this character Claire, who hails from present day Earth or Liverpool or whatever, what we're gonna see is her sent back in time by an angel in the very first episode, and then we're gonna come across her again later in the series in a historical setting where she's basically settled down, where she's established herself, where she's possibly even set up some sort of agency to combat the Weeping Angels perhaps, or has at least just become some sort of expert on them and some sort of fighter of the angels because in that second picture there's a load of sort of ghost hunting gear behind her all that sort of 70s stuff so that's perhaps what we're gonna see with that character but uh, yeah it's anyone's guess really as to how that's all gonna work what we do know for sure though by inference is that she does span multiple episodes and that she does span multiple time zones so I think that theory about her being sent back in time by a weeping angel seems fairly likely we now move on to the Sontarans, it would seem. So we have Jonathan Watson playing Ritzgore. Then alongside him, we have Sontaran veteran and aficionado Dan Starkey, who has of course appeared in multiple Sontaran episodes dating way back to the Sontaran stratagem in the Poison Sky, or the first appearance of the Sontarans in the revived series, and most famously played Strax for a number of years. He also played Ian the Elf in Last Christmas, and has also been associated with Big Finish in various capacities, both as an actor, I think, and also as a writer. I certainly wasn't expecting to see him again, to see a Sontaran actor carried over from the previous era. I guess I just thought that maybe they were going to have a whole new set of Sontaran actors for the Chibnall era. But no, they decided to bring him back and he'll be playing a different Sontaran called Kragar, I think is how you pronounce that. And yeah, it's just going to be very interesting to sort of compare and contrast this particular Sontaran to his other Sontarans from the past, and in particular to Strax and to see what it looks like in the new outfit and the new prosthetics. Finally, we have a few odds and ends. So we have a couple of other alien characters. I don't think they're Sontarans, but they have both got very alien sounding names. So we have Sarah Amankwa, I think is how you say her last name. She's playing an alien called Ensentak. 
And fun fact actually, but I was Googling her before making this video just to do some research, and it turns out I saw her on stage in a production of the Threepenny Opera way back in 2016. I don't remember anything about her or about her character, but it's nice to know nevertheless. Then alongside her we have Charlie Oscar playing a character called K hyphen Toscus. Is that how you say that? I mean, to be honest, it's anyone's guess really, but uh, yeah, there's that. So those two alien characters, what race they are or what they look like remains to be seen. Then we have a few more characters who could be human, could be alien, it's not entirely clear. We have Richard Tate playing a character called Wilder. We have Heather Bleasdale playing a character called Wilma. We have John May playing a character called Kev. And actually we do know for sure that this one is human. He's playing a character called Kev, who we saw in the preview clip for the episode where a guy knocks on Dan's door, trick or treating, but he's an adult. Whether he's gonna have a larger role beyond that or whether that's just literally the extent of his appearance in the episode remains to be seen. And finally, we have Gunnar Cawthry playing a character called John. John with no H and with an accent over the O, so possibly you pronounce that in a different way. Possibly this character is of a different nationality, possibly they're not English, it's not entirely clear. But uh, yeah, that's, that's it, that's everybody that's in the Halloween apocalypse that we know of. There is of course the possibility that one or more actors have been deliberately omitted from the cast list to preserve the surprise of their appearance. But having said that, there are a lot of characters already in this episode to squeeze in. You know, looking at this list, I'm not quite sure how they're going to manage it with the characters they've got. So if there are any secret ones in addition to all these, then it's going to be a very, very jam-packed episode. But what do you think? Do you have any theories about any of these characters or any of these actors? What do you make of Rashenda Sandal being listed under two names? What do you make of Swarm and Old Swarm and everything else in between? Do let me know in the comments below. I would love to hear what you've got to say. Please also leave a like if you enjoyed the video and subscribe if you haven't already for more Doctor Who Series 13 slash Flux themed content. Otherwise, I'll see you again very soon for one final video anticipating the Halloween apocalypse, a plot prediction which is basically going to guess what happens in the episode and in what order based on the information we've got so far. But otherwise, thank you so much for watching and goodbye for now.